The goal of this Pogol is to get you and your group members a little bit familiar with um, this concept of chemical nomenclature. Nomenclature might be a new word for you, but I think that you really know what it means. Nomenclature is just any system that we use to name things. So in chemistry, we're going to focus on how we can take things that may be represented symbolically, and then if we know nomenclature, we should be able to translate that symbolic formula into a name. In this case, the example is calcium oxide. So let's get started. To help you out and become more familiar with some simple inorganic rules that we use to name compounds, I'm giving you this flowchart and I want you and your group members to work through it and notice a couple of things. First, notice that you start up here in this top area. And essentially what you do is go through each question. Each question is either yes or no. And then notice that as you drill down through the flowchart, there become more and more specific pieces that you need to pay attention to. So I think it would be helpful, instead of just talking about this with you, if I actually work through some examples with you and then you can use those examples to help you solve the Pogel problems. So here's three examples. And just for clarity, I'm going to color code them so that when you watch this video, you'll know exactly how I follow the flowchart. So the first one, we see NaCl. So the first question that I'm going to follow, does the formula begin with hydrogen? Well, you can see that it begins with sodium, not hydrogen. So the answer is no. So we're going to go this direction. Does it begin with a metal which has more than one oxidation number? And for right now, you can think of uh, the most common ones are listed here. Iron, nickel, copper, tin, mercury, lead, cobalt, chromium, and gold. Well, sodium isn't in that list, so it does not begin with a metal that has more than one oxidation number. Notice that it does begin with a metal, though. Sodium is a metal. Does the formula contain a polyatomic ion? Now, we'll get to a polyatomic ion here in one of the other examples, but the answer right now is no. Are both elements nonmetals? Well, calcium, or sorry, sodium is a metal, chlorine is a nonmetal, so the answer is no. So here's the naming. Name the first element, okay, sodium. Then the second element with IDE. So what that means is instead of chlorine, we're going to call it chloride. Notice that I-N-E changes to I-D-E in this example. Okay, for our next example, number two we're going to do here in red. Does the formula begin with H? Well, the example in that case is no. Does it begin with a metal which has more than one oxidation number? No again. Does the formula contain a polyatomic ion? Now here's where we see an example of a polyatomic ion. I'm going to underline it here in yellow. That OH is a polyatomic ion group, and it has a particular name. So the answer is yes, it does contain a polyatomic ion. Is the polyatomic ion written first? Well, no, calcium is first. So here's our solution. Name the first element, okay, it's calcium, and then the polyatomic ion. Well, the name of this particular ion is called hydroxide. And don't worry about this. I'll give you a list of the common polyatomics that you'll encounter in the class. Okay, so so far we've gone through an example in blue where we have a metal and a nonmetal. The example in red where we have a metal with a polyatomic. And finally in green, we're going to go through one last example. Does the formula begin with H? The answer is no. Does it begin with a metal which has more than one oxidation number? Now notice here, you see copper, so the answer is yes. So the next step, name the first element, which is copper, followed by its oxidation number. Now to figure out its oxidation number, we have to be, we have to be kind of tricky because we have to know what the polyatomic charges in this case because elements and polyatomic ions are going to combine so that overall they form a neutral
compound. And you'll notice that CuNO3 has no charge listed overall, which means whatever charge the copper ion is, the nitrate ion, that's NO3, must have the opposite charge. Now metals are always going to be positively charged, so if we look it up, uh, and we look up nitrate, which is NO3, we see that it has a minus one charge, which means copper has to be equal but opposite, or plus one. So we denote that by putting a Roman numeral one in parentheses. All right, so we've named the first element followed by its oxidation number as a Roman numeral. We're gonna to go to the next question now. Does the formula contain a polyatomic ion? Yes, it does. Is the polyatomic ion written first? No. Name the first element, we've already done that, then the polyatomic ion. And NO3 is called nitrate. One last thing. Uh, I just want to make sure that you guys know some common ones. I mean, the flowchart lists some, but a lot of the elements that tend to have multiple charges, and I'm just going to underline them here in red, are found in the D block elements. Now these D block elements tend to form multiple charges pretty easily because they have mixing of the S. And this mixing between the S and the D block allows for some pretty complicated charge structures to form. So you'll see lots of things in here. Molybdenum forms multiple charges. Uh, palladium does. Cadmium. Uh, tin. Lead. Let's see, what am I missing here? Oh, gold, platinum, mercury. Notice how there's a, there's a pretty intense concentration of elements that have multiple charges in this uh, D-block region here. Uh, some of the other structures here, like tin and lead, those tend to form multiple charges just uh, because of their complexity of the higher energy level orbitals that they have. So, just to reiterate, for chemical nomenclature, your goal is to be able to take a chemical formula, like this, and be able to translate it into a name, in this case, calcium oxide. A tool to use until you get familiar is this flowchart. Now, you won't be able to use this flowchart forever, but to get you started, you, you should use this flowchart until you get comfortable with the rules of naming. We worked through three examples in increasing levels of complexity, and now I think you're ready to try it on your own. Good luck.